permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I'm James Max. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Primetime, bringing you all the stories that matter. On the show tonight... Britain slaps sanctions on China for two malicious hacking attacks. We delve into the murky, chaotic world of China's hacker army and ask, are we doing enough to combat the threat? Donald Trump is thrown an unexpected lifeline in one court trial, but fails to delay his separate criminal hush money trial, with the start date set for that one in three weeks' time. We'll have the latest. Also tonight, a weekend at Weatherspoons. We speak to the journalists trying to get to the bottom of the budget pub chain's soaring success. Plus, we'll bring our nightly panel looking at the other stories making the headlines today with Politic Joe's Ava Santina and Conservative peer Lord Ed Vasey. This is Primetime. Very good evening to you and a danger to democracy. Tonight, we cover the Chinese hack attacks on our country amid wrangling over whether the superpower is an epoch-defining challenge or a threat. The government has revealed how Chinese cyber spies targeted our democratic foundations, our electoral commission, our voting rolls and our data for the entire country breached. Dozens of MPs, including many China critics, hacked, harassed even impersonated. The group claimed to be responsible, named as APT31, even previously targeted Joe Biden's presidential campaign. This then was the response. Taken together, the United Kingdom judges that these actions demonstrate a clear and persistent pattern of behaviour that signal, signals hostile intent from China. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group. So amid the big words, what we're doing looks a little smaller. Whether or not damage was actually done, sanctioning two people and a company isn't exactly a massive response. Some MPs making just that point today. It is a little bit, this statement, like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. Why two? America has sanctioned over 40 people in Hong Kong. We have sanctioned none, and three lowly officials only in Xinjiang. Surely this means that the integrated review should now be changed. They are not an epoch-defining challenge, strange as that may be, but they are surely a threat, and can they now correct that so that we all know where we are with China? Now, it seems as if the US agrees, and in the last hour, it's indicted members of the group in question, seeking to prosecute rather than sanction. So will the sunlight and indeed the shame of exposure be enough to deter more attacks? Or do we need to go further? Well, for more on the sound and fury in Parliament, we're joined by Conservative MP Bob Seeley, down the line, and indeed the Sun's deputy political editor, Ryan Saby, in the studio. Thank you both uh, very much indeed uh, for joining us. Now, the threat, I suppose, of high, uh, Chinese hackers has been a common one of late. Um, but, uh, Bob, if I may turn to you first, if we're sort of dealing with this, have you been targeted by China or who of your colleagues has been? Um, I know that Ian Duncan Smith and Tim Loughton have been and both have done very important work over the years. Um, uh, there's a, a report out of America, um, which I think I've just sent through to your producer, saying that all the members of parliament who are members of IPAC, which is the Interparliamentary Alliance of China, have been hacked or may have been hacked. I'm a member of that 
whether that means I've been hacked or not, I'm not quite sure. And to be honest, it, it you know, I'm I'm not that bothered. I mean, it's it's not great, uh, but there's nothing particularly incriminating or, or dodgy on my, you know, on my Tinternet systems. I'd be rather more worried about the Chinese having access to AI, having access to big data firms, to AI firms, to people doing cutting edge research at Oxford and Cambridge and places like that for the intellectual property theft um, or indeed being able to tap up or spy on our spooks. So I think there are a lot more important people than politicians, but clearly because politicians are publicly elected, uh, there's a lot of interest in them. There certainly is. I mean, how do we work out what we should be worried about and what we shouldn't be worried about when it comes to um, other nation states having information either about us or indeed our politicians or our processes? Because if you have a look around the yeah. world, we have global activities. We know that we're forever looking on whether it's AI or um, the amount of information that's shared on, on the Google and, and other search engines available. There's a huge amount of data out there. It's actually a question of what you do with it as opposed to whether you have it. OK, uh, yeah, very good question. As far as I can see, the Chinese uh, steal or collect data for four reasons, but maybe there are others. They collect data on their own people because, look, they've got some of these apps which make life useful, but also it's a way of the communist regime uh, spying in some uh, spying on their own citizens in a way that would sort of blow George Orwell's mind when he was writing 1984. I mean, it's really uh, what they want to do or try to do is to identify people who are a potential threat to the state in order to isolate them, in order to punish them socially, etc. Um, they're stealing uh, intellectual property because it just saves having to develop, do years of research yourself. They're stealing the information in our electoral rolls because if they're building up individual targeting packs on individuals here, uh, either for influence or for espionage or for hacking or, or some kind of um, some kind of information gathering, that's useful. It's all useful information to have, but also in the years to come because of artificial intelligence and big data. And when you can crunch lots of data, uh, that that will give them an additional edge. I think the simple rule here, James, is that information and data is is power it's power now but increasingly it will be power for the future and that is why the chinese are stealing all this stuff you talk about stealing but then we've used manufacturing over in china for many years now and if you have a look at the technological products which have gone over there i mean you talk about iphones you talk about uh, computers and technology we only discovered with discovered with huawei uh, and then we see this huge dumping of electrical cars it's hardly new so what action should the government be taking on the basis that, as uh, Ian Duncan Smith so, said so clearly, um, you know, we, we've had a, an elephant giving birth to a mouse so far? OK, um, I think Oliver Darden has you know, made some good statements uh, in Parliament and I credit him with that. I, I just think for, for the UK as a whole, and it's not just with this government, but also with previous governments, there's a lack of coherence. Um, we could be talking about what do we do about Confucius Institutes because they're being used to spy on Chinese students, probably in this country. What do we do about TikTok having different algorithms inside China and outside China? What do we do about China's domination of rare earth? What did we do about Huawei? I led the campaign to kick Huawei out of the country. What do we do about preventing uh, China dominating supply lines or D or you know doing DNA research on cotton? prevent slave labor cotton coming from Xinjiang province. There's there are so many areas where this is a it is a, a really comprehensive threat, not just a challenge, but a threat. And it and it um, shows itself in many different ways. And you know, we haven't even raised the issue of of the amount of dumping that goes on because China is treated as a developing power under WTO rules and therefore can dump away. So it can produce, it can undercut and destroy German manufacturing and indeed UK manufacturing by dumping goods. And we don't have resource under WTO. So rather than just say it's this or that, it's pretty much so much a modern life. Cellular, mod, uh, cellular modules, the tiny groups of chips that are going to be running the Internet of Things soon as well, so, so that computers and fridges and cars will talk to each other increasingly in the future. So many of them are now made in China as well. So it's a hugely comprehensive uh, issue and we need, a co we need a coherent response to it. And we are probably still lacking one, if I'm honest. Bob Silly, MP, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talk TV. It's much appreciated. Now, uh, let's turn to the political side uh, of all of this. Ryan Sabi, Deputy Political Editor at The Sun, joins me in the studio. Ryan, 
Look, this is turning into a very politically hot and charged potato because we rely on China for so much of our trade and manufacturing. Um, we've welcomed, I mean, a decade ago, um, David Cameron, uh, then the Prime Minister, couldn't welcome the Chinese fast enough. Um, how toxic is this both for the Conservatives and indeed for Labour? Well, for the Conservatives, it's... It's particularly difficult. Um, you look at uh, Rishi Sunak, it wasn't that long ago when he had the strategic review. Uh, he was calling uh, China the epoch, uh, the epoch challenge, the challenging of our time. Now, a lot of people want to call it a threat, the epoch-defining epoch threat. That's what China are. So Rishi Sunak is actually, um, he's got a bit of a balancing act to play. But the trouble is, you look at the amount of investment that China are putting in, um, into this country. There's a £1.2 billion pound gigawatt factory that's on the cards. You look at the, the major inward investment from that country. It's very, very difficult for the Prime Minister to know, to know exactly what to do. And he's, and he's treading a fine line. It's also difficult to know what to do with the likes of... I mean, you talked about the investment side of things. Then there's the technology side of things, the manufacture side of things. And then there's um, companies like TikTok, which, of course, is hugely popular. Other countries have taken a far harsher line with the likes of TikTok, particularly when it comes to making money and how they dole it out, um, and, and also editorial policies and algorithms. We seem to have done nothing. Yeah, I think we probably take... We, perhaps we could do more. And I think the fact that you still have the Defence Secretary, um, Grant Shapps, you still got um, using uh, TikTok for his own uh, sort of personal uh, sort of, say, the development or um, in terms of um, actually trying to get his messages out there, um, actually says, um, says a lot about um, where the government actually stands on it. So I think in terms of... They, need, they probably need to send the right message out. And, but it's very, very difficult to, to, to ban these things. These are, you know, integral into sort of young people's lives. Um, and just finally, uh, in terms of the information that they've been targeting, I mean, do we really need to be that concerned about data that is in the public domain? I think on one level you can say, well, everyone knows where you know, your address is or, or what have you. But I think what the, the problem is, is the fact that it undermines democracy. That's what, it, that's what it really does. So you might say, all that information is out there. You only have to go to the li local library to check the electoral register. It's there for everyone to see. But the fact that it's undermining everything, I think it says a lot. And going into elections, you don't want undermining the election. You could be going into uh, sort of the territory of deep fakes um, within a few months because malign actors want to disrupt the election. And that's why the government have to really crack down on this. And that's why you've had Ian Duncan Smith and similar MPs um, saying the government needs to act further and faster. Well, I guess they need to act further and faster, but then they could do that on lots of fronts, and we haven't seen much action yet. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us this evening. That's Deputy Political Editor of The Sun, Ryan Sabi, uh, joining us there. Now, uh, you might want to know a little bit more about this because the threat of Chinese hackers has been a common one of late, but between private guns for hire and the might of the state, who are the thieves? And how much of a danger do they pose? Cybersecurity expert John Dunn is here to help with that. Uh, John, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, when we talk about uh, these dangers, we talk about um, data being hacked, we talk about uh, the sort of the technicalities of it. How uh, concerned should we be, and how prolific is it? Well, it's prolific, but it's it's not new, and this is the incredible thing. I mean, we we're, the government's very concerned about this right now. This has been going on for most of the last 20 years. And the Americans, uh, the then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, called this out famously in 2010 uh, during something called the Aurora hack. And uh, they, they discovered the Chinese had been attacking Google and eventually uh, actually hundreds, in fact, thousands of American companies. And this came as a huge shock, but that was 14 years ago. And here we are today still talking about the Chinese and, you know, Ian Duncan Smith just, you know, gave a rather sort of a choice description of this, um, you know, as, as, as an elephant giving birth to a mouse. And it does feel a little bit like this. I mean, there are two issues here. One is the fact that the Chinese are attacking us. But that's a given. That's been happening for years. The other one is why are we allowing it to continue? Why did the, you know, why was the Electoral Commission, uh, you know, hacked and this data taken from them? And what else does that imply about our security and the government security more widely? Now, when we talk about the sorts of things which are being undertaken, I mean, sometimes we talk about hacking because data is stolen, and sometimes we talk about hacking because things are disrupted. We've seen quite a lot of uh, attacks and cyber attacks on institutions, rendering them unable to function. 
Is that Chinese sponsored or is that stuff which is more coming out of other uh, nation states? Yeah, the disruptive attacks, that's a kind of, uh, well, that's, that's something called probably mostly something called ransomware. That's mainly a Russian driven phenomenon, probably state sponsored to some extent. Um, you also have the, the North Koreans and the Iranians. They're very aggressive in attacking uh, British interests and Western interests. The Chinese are really in, in it for intelligence and information. It's old fashioned espionage. They're taking a long term view. They want to understand who is saying what about them, who matters, who has power and what they're saying to each other. They're not really trying to sort of close down our power stations or stop institutions working in the way that ransomware would. They're trying to understand us. Yes, and I suppose by understanding that allows the competitive advantage. John Dunn, uh, cybersecurity expert, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. It's much appreciated. Now let's bring in our primetime panel now. Joining him in the studio, our political correspondent at Politics Show, Ava Santina, and Conservative peer and former MP, Lord Ed Vasey. Thank you both for joining me. Ava, um, this is something which has been rumbling on and on. It's just another thing that the government has uh, perhaps done nothing on. How concerned should we be about uh, particularly China as opposed to the ransomware and the other things that have been going on as well? With well our I, I don't really know what right we have to be that concerned when we continue to let China dominate um, our market in terms of imports. And we also allow quite a significant portion of the Chinese state to own a, a lot of real estate. I mean, I think they own around half a billion pounds worth of real estate, you know, in the southeast. That's absolutely extraordinary. And until MPs... It's not very much. No, but that, that, yes, is, like, that, that, is, like... that is a lot, because what we're talking about here is we're talking about, you know, cabinet ministers not having TikTok on their phones because that could be dangerous. What could be more dangerous than allowing, you know, a, a foreign state to actually own real estate in our but country? But lots of foreign states you know... own... I mean, they own their... I mean, you, they own... Um diplomatic buildings, they own uh, offices that they may use, they might have uh, state-sponsored banks or and otherwise. they supply the Does majority really of the technology that we use every single day? Oh, now, you see, that's more concerning. Uh, and, and, but I wouldn't worry about half a billion quid's worth of real estate, given how much London real estate in particular is worth around the country. I mean, you know, that's, I, I mean, that's a very small piece. But should we be allowing any foreign owner to own real estate is perhaps a, a conversation that we as a nation need to have. We've encouraged it for the last 30, 40 years and we've loved it. Um, um, Ed, look, this is kind of under your party's watch that um, you've opened the door to China. We had them coming over and having pints with the prime minister and all that action. And then suddenly it's like, oh, no, we don't want you anymore. Yeah, I actually went to the pub where the prime minister had a pint with President Xi and it's become a cult Chinese tourist the destination. They leave London on their way to, is it uh, Bista Village? Mm -hmm. Yes. And they stop at the pub and take photographs. It's amazing. Uh, I think there's a lot of kind of uh, smoke and mirrors about all this kind of uh, getting hot under the collar about what the Chinese are doing. As I think has become clear from quite a lot of these discussions, uh, every nation state hacks every other nation state. I mean, the Americans got into trouble because it was discovered they listened into Chancellor Angela Merkel from Germany's phone calls when you had that big uh, dump of American data. So that's one thing. I think this is bad manners on the part of the Chinese to target people like Ian Duncan Smith to target the people who criticise them. But as you were so shrewdly saying earlier, you know, they are trying to understand us. They're not trying to close down our power stations. And the Chinese can be very sort of cack-handed about this. They tend to be quite sort of panicky and weirdly kind of conspiracy theory people. So they get themselves very worked up when they get criticised by people like Ian Duncan Smith. They don't necessarily understand the cut and thrust of British public debate. And so somebody on high says, you know, find out more about this Ian Duncan Smith. And then some poor bloke in China has to go and hack his emails and find out more. But it's not really a massive threat to it's, it sounds like you're, you're, It sounds like you think this is a bit of a fuss over. I mean, I think it is a slight fuss over nothing. I mean, the big, big, big problem with China, you know, we trade with China. China's, you know, the second biggest economy in the well, world. I think it'd this be, was made there, be probably. Possible. Exactly. And exactly Should I right. be more worried about exactly. the fact that that was made there? Always, and this listens no, to me. Because I, I was the telecoms <laughs> minister when we were doing working with Huawei and everyone then went nuts about Huawei saying this is going to you know destroy Britain unless we get out of Huawei and I yeah, you know, I was getting texts on my phone and I would turn it around and say oh made in China mm. nobody's banging on about my Apple phone being made in China as being a threat to national security these are convenient political rounds I've, I've no problem by the way with us kind of sticking it to Chinese business in the way that Chinese China sticks it to British and uh, American business when they want to but the big big problem with China is Taiwan or oh, that's the big issue They've got a view. 
we've got a view, and that's a, it's very dangerous because we have very different views on the future of Taiwan. That's what we should be worrying about, not whether the Chinese try to mess about with the industrial Okay, Ava, I want, I want to know what you think we should be worried about when it comes to this, because I think there is an, the, there's an element which I think is probably right, which is um, everything isn't going well for the government, so let's have another crisis over which we can be distracted. Oh, here's something that we can all get behind, as opposed to we should probably reset our relationships with China and we need to work out what works and what doesn't. Well, yeah, and I think there's probably a good conversation to be having about the sort of dependency that we have on imports, not just from China, but from many parts of the world. I mean, in terms, you know, we talk about global Britain all the time. We have been global Britain for some, you know, some years now because we are entirely dependent on foreign nations. And, you know, perhaps, you know, if you were interested in some kind of security, that wouldn't be the case. But look, you know, I'm quite interested by Ed because he's at total odds with the rest of his party who've actually been have. there, but who've been making quite, quite the song and dance about it today. I think they've uh, really enjoyed going on the broadcast rounds to talk about how worried they are, but not in any practical, real terms. Well, you say it's at odds with this party. I mean, that might explain the polls. Now, <laughs> uh, we will come back to the pair of you in, uh, in due course. However, uh, we're going to be moving on because next on Primetime, there'll be more on cybersecurity as we look at how bots from China fed the social media feeding frenzy about the Princess of Wales. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Whirl -missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, James Max. Now, it's been three days since the Princess of Wales made her shock revelation to the country about her cancer diagnosis. But disinformation about Kate is still running rampant online. 
Whitehall sources now believe that China, Russia and Iran might be fueling the rumours about her on social media in an attempt to destabilise British institutions. Now, whilst Kate's message has mainly been met with an outpouring of public support, unfounded conspiracies about the truthfulness of the diagnosis and the efficacy of chemotherapy are continuing to circulate. Well, joining me live in the studio is Talk TV's royal editor, Sarah Hewson. Sarah, busy few days for you. Mm. Um, first of all, just going back to that announcement, now we've had time for it to sink in, how unprecedented was it for that sort of statement to be made and, indeed, at the time it was made? Uh, yes, and to be made in the manner in which it was made because the Princess of Wales isn't someone who's particularly at ease public speaking. And this was the most important address of her life, an address to the nation, an address to the world, bearing her most, her darkest hour, you know, this diagnosis of cancer that she's had and a plea to the public to bear with me, give me time, give me space, give me privacy uh, and I'll be back. Uh, and coming so soon off the back of the King's mm. uh, transparency around his, under, his own diagnosis, I think it really is unprecedented. And for all the um, comments before about, you know, the cack-handed nature of perhaps of how things have been handled when it came to the photographs and everything, as far as I'm concerned, that really drew a very solid line under this. It was brilliant by her in so many different ways, in terms of the honesty, in terms of the way it was delivered. And it, it was the kind of thing that it's... To me, it was kind of sad that we had to have that mm -hmm. because all of the other stuff and the mistakes which have been made probably by others. Having said that, I think it puts her in an amazing place and it also allows her to deal with um, so many issues going forward and now it moves on. But this stuff which is going on online is vile and it shines a light on it, doesn't it, as to just how wicked and cruel it is. Yeah, and you would have hoped that what she did would draw a line under it. And, you know, your sentiment about her having to do this, very much in line with what the Prince of Wales, Prince William, felt. Really proud of her courage in doing it. But a sense of anger. Why did we have to do this? Why did mm. she not have that right to privacy? But she made the decision two weeks ago that she was going to record this video statement and she was going to address the public directly and tell them exactly what had been going on. Meanwhile, on social media, the conspiracy theories continue. Uh, Whitehall officials now looking into whether or not they are being fueled by Britain's adversaries in Russia, Iran, uh, China, for example, in an attempt to bring into question the legitimacy of our institutions mm. to destabilise the monarchy and therefore the nation. I mean, there's a real sense in my mind that that has, if that's what people were looking to do, that has been achieved to an extent, which I think is a huge problem. But also there's a problem, in my view, with social and digital media. And the light should be shone very clearly on them by governments and institutions. Mm. By making outrageous statements, by the the conduct, if you like, of the social media giants who take no action. There are people making money out of being the most outrageous and the most conspiratorial that they can be. That is not acceptable. Linda Iaccarino, the CEO of X, formerly Twitter, came out with a statement of support for the Princess of Wales. But I think more than statements of support, Kensington Palace will be hoping that these social media companies will do something about it, because you are right. Conspiracy theorists are making money off the back of this. They don't care about the Princess of Wales or her health. Uh, there was uh, one featured in the newspapers this weekend who has you know, had conspiracy theories about COVID, about uh, Gaza and Israel, for example, even about aliens in his back garden. His posts generate millions of views, particularly that around the Princess of Wales, because it was picked up by a celebrity blogger in the United States. And off the back of that, you can sell subscription models and you can even sell merchandise. And they are making money off this. And I think it's very hard now to know who's real online uh, you people can hide behind anonymity, and that's a massive problem. It absolutely is, and I'm sure it's one that needs to be tackled. There we go. Sarah Hewson, uh, Talk TV's royal uh, editor, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talk TV. Now, next tonight, Donald Trump has been thrown an unexpected lifeline by a court in New York, as it agrees to press pause on the $454 million he owes in his civil fraud case.
He's not off the hook completely, though. He still has to pay $175 million. Find that down the back of the sofa within just 10 days. But if he does, it means that he could avoid what could have been a financial disaster, at least for now. The question still applies, though. Where will he get the cash? Rumours of a fire sale of things like a few of his 10 golf courses worth a collective $261 million have been thought about. Or maybe uh, his bit of a huge residential real estate portfolio, which includes his penthouse in Trump Tower or his property in Mar-a-Lago. Or his commercial assets, things like hotels, office space, retail buildings, which he owns across several major cities. That comes as Mr Trump is fighting a separate battle as the date for his first criminal trial, a hush money case against the former porn star Stormy Daniels, is set to begin on April the 15th. Well, joining me now is Fox News commentator Joe Concha. So, uh, Joe, thank you so much uh, for joining me here on Talk. Let's start with the cash ruling. Um, how much mm. of this is a win for Donald Trump? Because in anybody else's language, he's still got to find quite a few million dollars. As you said, that's not something that's easily found uh, under the pillowcase, right, or, or in the sofa uh, in, in this situation. But $175 million is a heck of a lot less uh, than $450 million, right? So th this is something that maybe is more plausible as far as him uh, getting that cash. Remember, uh, his media company, Trump Media, uh, is set to go public, and that's worth at least $3 billion on paper. So uh, where he gets the money from, whether it's somebody does decide to uh, loan him uh, this money or front it for him, uh, it, it's not exactly known. It would all be speculation at this point. But overall, from a political perspective, I mean, here in the States anyway, when you take out the rabid partisans, I mean, the whole case has been seen as an absolute crock, James. I mean, the, the judge in this case believes that Mar-a-Lago, for example, which you just showed on your screen, one of the most opulent, famous properties in the country, the second largest mansion in the state of Florida, 126 rooms, plush property on the ocean in Palm Beach. And this judge said it's only worth $18 million and Donald Trump inflated its value. I mean, the parking lot's probably worth $18 million. So real estate agents in the area say that property would easily list for $300 million. So the original fine is completely out of line. And I don't know how they expected Trump to come up with a half a billion dollars in just 30 days. Real estate transactions, even if it were to sell something, take many, many months, obviously. And you wouldn't have a lot of leverage as far as what he can get for it because people would know he'd have to sell. So this is clearly election interference. It's meant to hurt the odds on favor to win the presidency. And at this point, with all these different cases going on, for whatever reason, Donald Trump's poll numbers uh, continue to improve because people see these prosecutions as political and not because of the law. Right. Here's what I don't understand. Um, mm. I've worked in real estate for many years of my life, and every real estate developer, owner, uh, investor will always overinflate whatever they own, and you don't trust a word they sure. say. What you do is you go to valuers, people you can sue, and you listen to what they say in terms of value, and there's a difference between value and price anyway when you look at the technicalities. Mm. So I don't even understand why people are going after Donald Trump in the first place and how or even this is, you know, valid. Um, is there a real valid case here, and can he appeal it? Well, yes, he can appeal it, and probably in an appeals court, this will all be overturned for exactly the points that you just made. I mean, this, James, is a murder without a body. In other words, there's no victim here. No banks came forward and said, hey, Donald Trump, he he frauded us. He he inflated uh, the value of Mar-a-Lago or his other properties to get better uh, interest rates on loans. No one came forward to complain about this because Trump paid the loans back. And, and as you said, I sold a property not too long ago. And yes, I asked for more than I thought it was worth, but I got it. So does that make me a criminal or a good business person? And, and, and that's the thing here. So in the end, it, it seems that Again, these prosecutors, especially in a very, very liberal state like New York, they're, they're doing this to distract the American people from perhaps the Joe Biden record, which on inflation, crime, our border and immigration, uh, as far as energy, trade, foreign policy, uh, he's underwater vastly in terms of polling. In fact, right now he's polling lower than any president at this stage of his presidency in polling history. So. All we hear about is Donald Trump's in court here or court there. This case is going against him. And it does distract uh, people from what's really going on in the country, perhaps, uh, as far as who's better to run the country, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Uh, but all we're talking about are legal trials at this point. So perhaps it is a strategy that is definitely political and certainly not about the rule of law.
Well, I'm always fascinated whenever uh, Joe Biden comes onto a screen as to whether or not he'll make it to the end of a sentence, let alone a paragraph. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> there is another issue, though, when it comes to hush money. Uh, this is mm. the criminal case which is being held against Donald Trump. And perhaps, I mean, look, from a media perspective, it's going to be like a feeding frenzy like we've seen no other. Uh, that's set for uh, April the 15th. What exactly does that mean for Donald Trump and indeed his campaign? Well, of all the cases against Trump, sane and sober legal analysts like Jonathan Turley here, for example, who also uh, is with Fox News and is no fan personally of Donald Trump, will tell you that this is the weakest of the bunch of all the cases against Trump. And, and you have Alvin Bragg, who is the district attorney uh, in Manhattan. He's already screwing things up. Uh, for example, the trial was supposed to start today, but now it's been delayed at least out till mid-April because uh, Bragg didn't share key documents with the Trump legal team until the last minute. And that shows an air of desperation. And again, the judge scolded Bragg for withholding these documents. And remember, federal prosecutors had already closed this case without filing any charges against Donald Trump. And, and Michael Cohen apparently is the star witness. He's Trump's former attorney and fixer. Uh, and this federal judge called Cohen a serial perjurer. So, you know, if the, this case, which should have been thrown out and may be thrown out anyway, I, I don't think moves the needle one way or another. And quite frankly, uh, Americans, again, that we have much bigger problems over here than uh, about hush money that may or may not have been paid to a porn star uh, more than eight years ago. I mean, obviously, this is being done for political reasons as well. May very well. Uh, I'm still going to get some popcorn, though. I think we'll all enjoy it. Joe Concha, Fox News Absolutely. commentator, thank you so much for joining us here on Talk. Thanks, James. Now, next on Primetime, what would you see if you spent 24 hours in a Weatherspoons? We'll be finding out next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Prime Time with me, James Max. Next tonight, let's talk pubs. Don't know about you, I love a pub. Now, given that it's a Monday evening, I'm sure there'll be viewers, some of you have visited a pub over the weekend, and it may have been a trusty Weatherspoons. Now, if you did, I bet your session wasn't quite as long as that of the consumer journalist, Harry Wallop, who, in the name of research, yes, I believe him, he spent a full 24 hours inside one of the spoons to get to the bottom of why they're so darn popular. Naturally, the budget boozers aren't everyone's cup of tea, but the figures speak for themselves. With 21.4 million Brits visiting in the last six months alone, the pub empire, it's expanded from one North London watering hole to more than 800, with the founder, Sir Tim Martin, now aiming to hit triple, triple figures. So, what's the source of the power that a Weatherspoons holds over the British public? Is it the prices or... Perhaps it's something more. Well, joining me down the line is consumer journalist and all-round great bloke, Harry Wallop. You do these things for the nation, Harry. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here on Talk. So, Spoons, we know that they do a cheap pint, but what else do they do? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, what's so clever about the company is they don't just compete with other pub companies, and they've obviously got a lot of stick for being partly responsible for lots of pubs struggling across Britain, you know, 500 pubs closed last year and was Weatherspoons to blame. Their point is that, of course, they compete with far more than pubs. They compete with cafes and greasy spoons in the morning. They have breakfast. Their breakfast is very popular. The free coffee refills uh, mean that they attract all sorts of people, particularly things like pensioners uh, in the morning. Uh, £1.56 with a free refill. I mean, that that is the sort of value you cannot get in a Costa or a Cafe Nero. And then, and then in the evening, of course, they serve lots of food. Uh, and most pubs now have to serve food if they want to be successful. And Spoons, I think, is, is Britain's most successful fish and chip shop. Uh, they sell more fish and chips than any other uh, people. And indeed, Britain's biggest curry house. So it's just, it's a kind of whole range of things that they've, they've replaced. It's the, it's the church coffee morning to the student union uh, to the working man's club. Now, I did see that they had won a Lou of the Year award uh, because people consider that they're lavatories, even though you do have to take a precarious journey upstairs normally. Uh, apparently, they are quite good. Uh, that having been said, it must be more than that. What did you experience in your 24 hours in a Spoons? And did you do it over two days or was it a, a one-day extravaganza sleeping under one of the tables because you had too many pints? Uh, no, I was able to do 24 hours because uh, of the 809 pubs they currently run, uh, 55 of them have a hotel attached. So I slept upstairs in the Briar Rose, Birmingham, and I did it over two days uh, because that's how, the way it worked. Uh, so it was a full 24 hours without leaving that pub, uh, except for to pop outside to chat to the bouncers. Uh, yeah, it's a whole mixture of things that make it so successful. I mean, it's obviously crucially prices, uh, and that was the main reason people gave. I spoke to, you know, tons and tons of customers. The other word that was a surprising word lots of customers used was accessible. It's a very modern word. But it's like, well, I wouldn't necessarily choose this as my first option. Uh, but the other people in the group I'm with, be it a stag party or a 40th birthday party or be it a redundancy leaving do, and those are all things I encountered, it's the one that covers all the bases. It's the, it's the common denominator. We're all okay we're all comfortable being in a Weatherspoon. So I think that's, you know, that's the secret to a lot of very successful consumer companies uh, in Britain, you know, from Greg's to say Next, the clothing chain. It's a little bit boring, but by golly, it's unbelievably successful by giving people what they want at a decent price and not being too outre, not, you know, not trying to be pretentious. It's just down to earth. Um and as you say, very accessible to all, which I think is the key to success. So there's nobody uh, in the nation who wouldn't perhaps go to a Spoons for whatever reason. Just one final question, if I may. Uh, I know that you sat down with Sir Tim Martin. Uh, he's a charismatic uh, chap. I've interviewed him on a, a numerous occasions here on Talk. Uh, and he's always got something to say. But what did he say when it came to either discussing the, uh, the Brexit deal, which, of course, he fought for Brexit, uh, or indeed on, on other things which he's perhaps been more outspoken about, what did he say to you? Well, uh, I mean, he reiterates his point that pubs are taxed unfairly. Uh, they, of course, have to you know, slap VAT on food and drink that gets passed on to the customers. And supermarkets don't. 
Again, the point that Weatherspoon really competes with supermarkets just as much as with other pubs. On Brexit, you know, the argument is that, well, Brexit hasn't been a huge success, has it? And his point is it doesn't really matter. The reason he campaigned for it was a philosophical point, which was democracy, which is that we have to have the right uh, to vote for the politicians who make our rules. And that's, you know, that's a very strong argument. So he has absolutely zero regrets about Brexit. It doesn't matter whether it's a success or not. It's about uh, whether we are in charge of our own destiny. Well, consumer journalist Harry Wallet, thank you very much indeed for spending the time at The Spoons so we don't have to. Much appreciated. There we go. Now, next on Primetime, I'll be joined by the Primetime panel, where we'll be going over some of the other top stories from the day, including Olivia Coleman claiming that she'd be paid more if she was called Oliver. That's next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Time now for our primetime panel to dissect some of the other big stories of the day. Joining me in the studio are political correspondent at Politics Joe, that's Ava Sabatina, and Conservative peer and former MP Lord Ed Vasey. Thank you both for joining me once again. Now, uh, Ava, you've been busy today. You've been following tractors, not because you've got some weird, uh, I don't know, interest in them. It's actually because there have been an awful lot of them coming to central London. What did you see? Yeah, that was over the weekend. Today was actually just following them for work. But uh, so I, uh, a lot of tractors. Actors, a lot of farmers travelled around, down from around the country. There were some from Leicester, some from Maidstone, some from Winchester, Windsor, all sorts. They all drove their tractors to New Covent Garden Market, which is in South London, and then they drove those tractors 
to Parliament. And they're very upset for many reasons, but primarily because our food security is extremely weak at the moment. They're also very upset about net zero. So they're having to replace a lot of their equipment to meet net zero targets when other countries, other suppliers in other countries don't have to do that. I think we're all fed up about net zero on the basis that when government puts net zero and talks about reducing energy use, which may start with a scintilla of sense, uh, they end up with policies that make no sense and we all get hit. Why is it, uh, Lord Vasey, since you sit in there, that politicians seem to have no connection with humans in the rest of our nation on what makes common sense and common sense policy? I didn't even see a tractor today and I was in the House of Lords, so I feel well, a bit like Lord Nelson. Well, that's, I see well, no tractors. Well, that's because you're so no divorced tractors. from what's going exactly. on on our streets. What could be a better example? You were more interested in what you are going to have for lunch. Exactly. And boy, was it a good lunch. But I'll tell you something. Why did we vote for Brexit if our farmers are having to follow net zero rules and the French are not? Well, the, the big problem is actually South African suppliers. That, that's a really big one. So they, they can still... So the tractors that our British farmers have to use, they've all had to be replaced and they cost upwards of £100,000, up to half a million. South African farmers can still use gas-guzzling tractors. Oh. And then both of their products are sold side by side in an English supermarket and well, no-one knows the difference. Exactly. Well, I, I guess we can talk about, and everything goes back to Brexit and how it ruined our dinner parties. Or net, and probably, zero. Or net zero. And all that other stuff. Uh, meanwhile, one reason that may explain why uh, a particular political party is maybe being a little bit more successful could be those very reasons. Lee Anderson, he isn't the only man now backing reform. A new poll by YouGov has found that more men now support Richard Dice's party uh, than the Conservative Party, 19% to 17% accordingly. But with Labour being the most popular choice, with 41% of men, uh, does it really matter? Um, look, the rise of reform must surely be of concern to the Conservative Party, Ed. Yeah, too right. I mean, again, why did we vote for Brexit? Sorry to sound like a stuck record. I mean, it did. It, it does kind of interest me, because I always compare... Because a lot of people I want to leave well, the European Union. Well, I Union. compare Brexit to the French Revolution, in the sense that every kind of phase of the French Revolution... Uh, a new set of radicals came along and chopped off the heads of the previous set of radicals. And it is a great irony that the Tories called this referendum in order to solve the UKIP problem. That then went spectacularly wrong when everyone voted to leave. But it, guess what? It didn't solve the UKIP problem. We've now got it in the shape of reform, which is eating the Tory party but, alive. This yes, revolution is still... Yeah, look, you have to... You, there are two reasons. Because the Tory party has become the Brexit party. No. And basically the ultimate... Uh, logic that. of that is that the Brexit Party, I reform, no. will take over the, the Tory, Tory party. The Tory party demonstrated utter incompetence when given the opportunity to deal with Brexit and to provide a proper Brexit future. They didn't do it. Yeah. They had an open goal. That's right. They missed on every occasion That's because right. they were so distracted by doing stupid, stupid things themselves. It Detractors. was unbelievable. Detractors, for example. No. Mm. And so, I mean, that's the point. This... Brexit revolution will never stop in the Tory party until eventually it becomes the Brexit party, whether it's called reform or whether it's called the Tory party. Or, you know, you actually implement some decent policy. That would actually be quite enticing, perhaps, some voters. I think there's a real concern here that a lot of people, a lot of MPs are really focusing on the reform party and using it almost like a safe word as to why they're going to lose the next election. And it would be, it would be good if some MPs perhaps focused on a bit of reflection I thought, you know, perhaps it's not Richard Why are you Tyson. Looking at me? I'm, not I'm not looking at you. I'm just making the <laughs> yes, point. Yes, but it is your party, but... and, well, and Ava makes a, Ava makes a very good point, I which despair. is if the Conservative Party actually had some policies, and indeed a Chancellor who put in the right measures that made sense, we might actually have a situation in which they had kept their lead. But they've made every mistake possible. Well, the Tory party has been at war with itself since 2016. In fact, beyond that, before that, if the Tory party united, as you say, and had a set of clear policies that they were going to implement instead of infighting wow. with each other, having endless leadership elections... If David Cameron... choosing new prime ministers, we might be in with a fighting chance. If David Cameron admitted that his deal that he came back with from Europe was rubbish, we wouldn't have been in the mess in the first place. However, let's talk about another mess, because an Oscar-winning actress, Olivia Colman, has claimed that she would earn more money if she was called Oliver whilst criticising the gender pay gap in Hollywood. All I know is that if I called myself Julia, I'd probably get paid more here. So, look, it's forever thus. Different people are paid more. Exactly. If Julia Roberts was starring in a show with Matt Smith, Julia Roberts would get paid more than Matt Smith. It's about your star power. And Olivia Colman got paid more than Prince Philip in The Crown. 
Well, well, I'm not even that bothered about that, to be honest. I'm, I'm not going to feel sorry for a, a Hollywood millionaire. But I think, you know, what would be helpful for these actresses to be talking about is the sort of exploitative way that Hollywood acts towards its more lower paid staff. So it's producers, it's sound engineers, it's mm. lighting. You know, if you if you it's actually cared about women, point. you should be looking at people at the bottom of the pay scale, not at yourself. You should point. absolutely be doing that. Anyway, lastly tonight, let the bells ring. That's what the campaigners have said in Devon after the chimes of St John the Baptist Church in Witheridge were silenced overnight due to, it says here, noise complaints. It wasn't, it was one complaint. The local council, they've spent around £2,000 on a device to silence the bells between 11pm uh, and 7am. I mean, I find it extraordinary this has been allowed. One complaint and they stopped the bell. It's been ringing for hundreds of years. This is what happens to pubs up and down the country. It drives me wild. We nearly lost one of the oldest clubs in Soho because one millionaire was upset about a little bit of noise that was happening out the I'm back I'm totally in favour of the complainant. In fact, he had a yeah. brilliant quote in the paper where he basically said, I went to the parish council, I asked to have a reasonable discussion and they told me to, you know, go away move. and, you know, to whatever. Move. And no, so I went and made I th a complaint. I think the individual... The parish council have been reasonable the, about this. The, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The individual should leave the village. Anyway, Mike Graham is up next. <laughs> Mike, what's on your show tonight? Well, it sounds to me like you've been overtaken by mob rule, James. I mean, you know, we're all against mob rule in this place. We don't like mob rule. Uh, unfortunately, we are going to be taken over by mobs uh, if Dame Khan is to be believed. We're going to look at that. And we look up to Scotland as well, where an MSP um, made a comment about something the SNP wants to do about gender. And suddenly he's found himself being taken down for a hate crime. Uh, not a real hate crime, though, no, just a thought hate crime. You know, that's not so important. Finding out all about that, China, Russia, and, of course, Israel as well. It's all coming up at 8 o'clock. Fantastic. Well, I'm back in control now. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. And that's all we've got time for tonight. I'll be back on prime time tomorrow. Thanks for watching. And, of course, you can catch me on Early Breakfast. That's at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. And the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, that's next. Good night. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such is the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>